Welcome back to the Career Profiles podcast. I'm your host, Sean, joined as always by Johnston for another look at another great in this sport. And you find that we talk about a lot of great fighters in this sport, and some of them are greater than others. Some of them are even labelled the greatest fighters or the greatest fighter in the sport. And this particular fighter is absolutely no exception to that rule of thumb of being one of the greatest fighters of all time. This episode is all about Henry Armstrong. He is labelled as one of the greatest fighters of all time. Some people have him as the greatest fighter of all time. Some people have Sugar Ray Robinson, some people have Muhammad Ali. It's very subjective, that list. But we know one thing for sure, that Henry Armstrong is an absolute legend of the sport. One of the first to do a lot in this sport. One of the first to create records in this sport and we're really excited to be talking about his life and his career and the notable moments within his boxing career and the things that makes him a historic great fighter. Johnston this is an exciting one for the final episode of this round of our career profiles episodes because we like covering different stories but when we get to a point where it's like, look, who who are the fighters that we haven't covered before? Like the greatest fighters that we haven't already covered before. And you come up with someone like Henry Armstrong. It excites you because you literally are ready to learn so much more than what you already know about these guys. And this is what we like to bring to the table, isn't it? It absolutely is. Uh, he, he features, as you just rightly said, Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Robinson and Henry Armstrong. I'd say many people that have watch the sport look to the sport dig through the archives of the history of it you'd always cut with an name Henry Armstrong so it's been a, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to bring this to you guys you know we've done Harry Greb we've done Sugar Ray Roberts we've done Muhammad Ali we've done Roberto Duran done some magnificent fighters and and Henry Armstrong I mean he just he fits that category superbly and we don't normally do this but I'm gonna plug a book we've used as part of source to source this episode and it's from John Jurette uh Henry Armstrong boxing super champ and you know what? I'm going to begin it with his quote, Sean. Uh, it's a great quote right at the front of the book, guys. And it says, In the long storied history of boxing, there were good fighters, great fighters, and then there was Henry Armstrong. Now, the story, as always, begins when he was born, Henry Jackson Jr., on December the 12th, 1912. Ironically, 12, 12, 12, if you're looking at that date. And he was born in Columbus, Mississippi. He was the 11th child out of a total of 15. His father, Henry Jackson Sr., had a multi-decent origin. He was Indian, Irish and African-American, while his mother, America Armstrong, was said to be a full-blooded Iroquois, although some sources suggest she was Cherokee. Henry Jackson Sr. was a sharecropper and a butcher who lived with his wife on his Irish father's owned plantation who had married one of his slaves. When the oldest, Jackson, Ollis, first saw his newborn brother Henry, he remarked, Gee, Mum, he looks like a little rat. His mother quickly defended her latest addition to the family, telling her oldest, He may look like a rat now, but someday he'll be the big cheese in this family. Call him a rat if you want to, but he's going to do something that no other man has done. Something that has godliness about it. Henry would repeat this story many times, varying the dialogue slightly and finishing it about his mother, he would say, she died in 1918. I don't know if she'd think boxing had any godliness about it, but maybe, maybe she would. In Henry's autobiography, Henry Armstrong, Gloves, Glory and God, he said that his father, Jackson Sr., was a sturdy sort of little man with a stern character and a solid reputation. He said, working the lifelong day so the new baby and the older ones and mum could eat. He didn't have the time to celebrate the fact that he'd become a senior with a junior in the cradle in the cabin. He just went on working to feed and clothe and shelter the family in the log and shingle house. He was a sharecropper, one of the millions driven mercilessly by that cruel and jealous despot King Cotton. Yeah, little rat grew in the midst of cotton fields and the men and women who worked them. Not the men and women who owned them. 
Barney Nagler of the the Ring uh, wrote in 1981 that when Armstrong was a child, to find employment, his father moved the family to a three room house in St. Louis, Missouri, where he worked for the independent packing company. The reason for the move from rural south to the Midwest and north of the country was due to needing work and was part of the early period of the great migration of African Americans. Now, Henry actually attended the Toussaint L'Overture Grammar School in St. Louis, where due to his small physical frame, he was picked on by the other kids, which of course forced him to want to learn how to defend himself. It was at this point that he actually found boxing that early, running the eight mile distance from home to school also helped him develop his athletic abilities. By the time he moved to Vashon High School, he was tough enough to earn himself a reputation as someone not to be messed with. It was mentioned that Henry Jackson's hair had come in red and he was known as Red Jackson. He was small but a fierce brawler in the streets. His fraternal grandmother, Henrietta Chapman, took over the task of disciplining him after his mother's death from consumption in 1918, as you mentioned. He was hard to handle but soon conformed to his grandmother's demands. Thanks to his grandmother, Henry did not neglect his education either, getting good grades and was even elected class president by his fellow students. At his graduation as an honorary student, he read a valedictory poem that he had written himself to say his goodbyes, which demonstrates that Henry was very articulate by this time that he left school and could have probably gone on into further education rather than have a life in the boxing ring. However, by the time that he had finished high school, his 60-year-old father was suffering with arthritis and rarely able to work a full week, forcing 17-year-old Henry to jump straight into full-time employment and bring in some much-needed income to the family home. Now, we're not sure what sort of work Henry was doing from 16 to 20, but we do know that when he was 21, he was hired as a section hand for the Missouri Pacific Railroad, which he claimed paid $20 a week. In Henry's autobiography, he recalled that one day he read in a St. Louis newspaper that a favourite fighter of his, Kid Chocolate, had beaten Al Singer at the polo grounds in New York City and had earned $75,000 doing it. That was real money. That was fabulous. Why, you could work a year on the railroad at $20 a week and earn just barely more than $1,000 a year. And in 75 years... But no, there was just no sensible way of making a comparison. Henry told the man next to him on the handcar that evening about Kid Chocolate's $75,000 purse and someday I'm going to make that much money in the ring, he concluded. Armstrong once said in an interview, So, I put my tools in the box and quit. I told the boys I was going to be a champ. They laughed, sure, but in seven years, I was. Now, the job on the railway helped strengthen his upper body and by running everywhere, he was able to increase the power in his legs and his stamina. These were key ingredients that would shape Henry as a fighter. Eventually, he was laid off from the railway job, but he got himself another job at the Universal Hat Shop in St. Louis, working from 9 to 5. Because of the lack of physical demands that the job delivered, he decided then to spend his evenings at the coloured YMCA on Pine Street every day after work. And it was here that he was spotted working out by a trainer called Harry Armstrong. Now, he needed a sparring partner for his fighter, Eddie Foster. He asked Henry if he could go a few rounds, and to everyone's surprise, Henry dominated him, impressing. Henry swung and missed, swung and missed, before Harry held up his hand. A few words of encouragement and they are off again. This time, Henry managed to hit Harry, and the older man dropped to the canvas. Boy, you sure can punch, he said, getting to his feet and rubbing his jaw. He was already thinking that his boy was worth training. He heard Henry singing in the shower, and as the lad dressed, he said, that's it, I'm going to call you Melody, Melody Jackson. Now, when they parted that evening, Henry sang all the way home. He had a feeling with Harry he could get somewhere. The journey had already begun. 
So by January 1930, Henry Jackson was encouraged to enter the Amateur Athletic Union held at the St. Louis Coliseum. Now, he didn't eat anything all day, drinking only two pints of milk. So he had actually read that this was something that Gene Tunney did before a fight, so he adopted the trick. Eager to impress, Henry actually arrived at the Coliseum an hour before they even opened the doors, standing outside in the freezing cold, freezing his ass off in the snow. When he finally entered, he saw that his opponent was a guy called Jimmy Birch. It was someone that he knew well. In fact, he thought that Birch was better than him, and he was for the first two rounds until Henry threw hell for leather in the third and final round. His heavy hands and relentless hurricane of punches knocked Birch out for the count. Henry Jackson was now the featherweight champion of the West. A local promoter who was impressed with both fighters decided that a rematch was needed. So in front of a large crowd at the big hall in Pine Street, the boys went at each other again, this time in a four-rounder. Once again, it was Birch who seized control of the fight. He took the first three, and in the process, he broke Henry's nose, gave him a black eye and bust open his lip. Henry then showed amazing heart and determination, accompanied with power when in the fourth, he knocked out Birch again. He was given a voucher worth $5 for his victory to use in a sports shop. However, when he attempted to purchase some goods, he was told that they were invalid. He went in search of the promoter, only to discover that the promoter had skipped town. In Henry's autobiography, he said that when he returned, his family empty handed and a face that looked like a battered fart, his sister-in-law, Emma Lou Jackson, said, Why don't you stop all this fighting, Henry? Get these wild notions out of your head. Settle down. Become a preacher. Henry's response was, I'm not ready to be a preacher yet. Sis Lou, someday maybe. But just now it looks like it's me for fighting and fighting for me. After knocking out Roy Johnson in two rounds, he travelled with Harry, Eddie and a big police dog to Pittsburgh, where they tried desperately to get more fighting experience. It took five long weeks, but after training hard and eating Harry's nasty concoction of cabbage, salt pork and whole wheat bread, Henry initially matched with a good feather in Jackie Wilson. However, Wilson pulled out due to injury and a two-fight novice in Al Lavino stepped in as a replacement. This would be Henry Jackson's first professional fight, but his opponent was much trickier than his professional record suggested. So Al Lavino had an excellent amateur record, and he was also a lefty. He hadn't fought a lefty before. Uh, they fought on the Teddy Yaros undercard at the Apple Mayors Bowl, an open-air arena in Pennsylvania, on July the 27th, 1931. Now, Henry struggled to cope with his Southpaw opponent, and he was put down twice in the second round, and in a third and final time in round three, all of them from body shots. Now, Henry had lost his first professional fight, and it wasn't a fix or a home fighter's decision. He wasn't robbed. He was just simply outclassed by a guy who was better than him on the day. The one saving grace for young Jackson was that he earned himself the biggest purse to date, and that was $35. Now, the story behind this fight was uncovered years later by a sports editor of the Pittsburgh Sun-Telegraph, Harry Keck. And he recalled that I received a letter one day in 1938 from little Jimmy Thomas. Now, do forgive some of the language. It is, uh, you know, it's how it is these days. But he said, a Negro featherweight in Pittsburgh who was then boxing in California. In it, he told me that the great Henry Armstrong was none other than Melody Jackson who had boxed in Pittsburgh seven years before. He wrote, I'm sure of it. My manager, Abby Witts, used to pay him a dollar a day to work out with me in the Salvation Army gym in Pittsburgh. You should remember him. Al Lavino knocked him out at Mayer's Bowl. With this information, I approached Lavino, who no longer was fighting, but was working as a carpenter's helper. And he said, I thought there was something about the pictures of Armstrong in the newspapers. Now that you mention it, I'm sure he's the same fellow. But the man I fought was named Melody Jackson. I had trouble 
getting bouts because I was a southpaw and could hit. All I could ever do was punch. When recalling the bout with Jackson slash Armstrong, Lavino said, Melody was deceptive in build. I weighed 123 pounds and he appeared much heavier. He wanted to weigh in in his street clothes, but we made him strip and were surprised when he scaled only 120 pounds. He was all arms and shoulders. He came buzzing after me, boring in from the start, and I let him come, nailing him with lefts to the body and head. He was made to measure for my southpaw counterpunching. He went down twice in the second round from punches to the stomach. The end came in the third from another good one. Harry Keck would later recall, I caught up with Henry before one of his championship bouts in New York and asked him for an explanation. At first he denied that he had ever boxed Lavino, but finally admitted it. He said the reason he had kept the bout a hidden chapter in his career was that he would have lost his amateur status had it been known that he fought as a professional. On returning to St. Louis, he resumed as an amateur under his own name until he went on to Los Angeles where he got his first real break. As mentioned by Harry Keck, Henry would head back to the amateurs but before he returned home, he picked up his first professional win. He floored Sammy Burns three times en route to a points victory just four days after the Lavino fight, collecting another $35 for his night's work. Harry Armstrong, Eddie Foster and Henry Jackson returned to St. Louis via Chicago, where they watched the likes of Eddie Shea and Barney Ross working out. Henry was unable to settle at home. He was itching to leave town and pursue his dream of earning those thousands of dollars like Kid Chocolate. He read the latest knockout boxing magazine issue and saw Speedy Daddo wearing flash clothes and a diamond ring. He was one of the little guys making five grand every couple of weeks in California. This was the inspiration that Henry needed. He was going to California in search of his dreams and Nat Fleischer actually wrote in 1938 that trip to California is still one of the nightmares of Henry Armstrong's life. His face becomes serious and slightly sinister when he speaks of the jungle camps from which they were chased by the other hobos and railroad police, the days without food and the many provisions of life on board which they were subjected. However, he reached California with that indomitable will, more still than ever, his spirit burning, with that irresistible driving force. Well, after arriving at Colton, California, they actually hitchhiked the rest of the journey to Los Angeles rather than risk a second train. The driver told them of Central Avenue, which was the main street of the black area of Los Angeles. He advised them that the best hotel in town was the Dunbar, and he dropped them off there. However, the boys can see from the outside that this hotel was not the sort of place for them. So they opted to make the trek to Central Avenue instead, where an old-time boxer called Eagle Thomas gave them 25 cents to get just a bed, a bed for the night at the Midnight Mission. Now, with no money in their pocket, they stood in line at the soup kitchen at the Midnight Mission. Armstrong was a little bit crafty, and he often sneaked back into their line for a second helping of hot cakes. Well, Nat Fleischer wrote in the Black Dynamite Volume 2 article that for the next few days, the boys haunted the gyms in Los Angeles, the Main Street, the Manhattan and the Ringside. Unable to get in because of the admission charge, they stood on the curb and just hoped. At this juncture of Henry's career, along came Leroy Haynes, who was to be cast in the role of Good Samaritan. Large Leroy, himself no stranger to the trials and tribulations of the black boxer, lent a sympathetic ear to the little fellow's plea. Not only did Leroy afford the boy's entrance to the gym, but he also made an effort to get a manager for Henry. He dug up one, Paddy Quaid, as a prospective mentor. Now after watching the stranger work, Quaid declared that he couldn't be bothered with what he called just another fighter. The boys had better luck with the second prospect, Tom Cox, who promoted bootleg boxing shows. After watching Henry make short work of a spa mate in two rounds, Cox wasted no time in reaching for his fountain pen and extending Armstrong a long-term contract. 
as Harry advised Henry to sign his name as Armstrong and not Jackson in case of a possible complication that might void the contract. Harry then told his young fighter, Forget Melody Jackson, from now on you're my brother, Henry Armstrong. When Cox came up with a $5 advance, the contract was signed and Henry Armstrong was born. Henry later claimed that, during his first year as an amateur in Los Angeles, he fought between 80 and 90 fights and won them all. However, it was more likely that he won 58 out of 62 amateur fights, earning a few dollars on the side for each fight, yet he still had to shine shoes to make ends meet. Thomas Hauser wrote for TopRank.com in 2011 that in the summer of 1932, Henry Armstrong competed for a spot on the United States Olympic team, but was eliminated in the trials. So, he put the disappointment to one side and decided it was now time to turn over to the pros for a second time. Yeah, so that was the end of Cox. So Cox actually chose to sell his contract to Whit Ross, a guy called One Shot, who paid $250 for it. Now, after selling his contract, Cox told Henry and the rest of the boys report to him at the Main Street gym. He's taken over from there on. Good luck. Well, novelist and screenwriter Bud Schilberg described this gym, the Main Street gym, in just fantastic, great detail when he was writing his book, The Harder They Fall. Quite simply, we're going to read it out to you. So, the Main Street gym looks like a shabbier twin of Stillman's in New York. The street is girdier than 8th Avenue. It offers cheap burlesque houses and dime movies for adults only. Dim and dingy bars with raucous junk boxes and blousy bee girls for your fortune for a dime. Your haircut for a quarter, whiskey for 15 cents, love for a dollar and a five cent flop. Classy place then. When outside the entrance of the gym was the usual sidewalk gathering boxes, managers, old fighters and hangers on. Going up the long, grimy stairway that seems to be the standard approach to every fight gym, upstairs with the same dirty grey walls, the same lack of ventilation and sanitation, and the same milling activity of consecrated young men with narrow waists and glistening skin, bending, stretching, shadow boxing, sparring, punching bags or listening earnestly to the instructions of the men with fat bellies, boneless noses, dirty sweatshirts, brown hats pushed back on sweaty foreheads, the trainers, the managers and the experts. Only here on Main Street, there were even more dark skins, not only black like those that had to come to outnumber the whites in Stillman's, but the yellow and brown skins of the Filipinos and Mexicans who poured into the gym from the slums of L.A. In California, the Mexicans fighting their way up out of the brown ghettos dominate the light divisions. Ortiz, Chavez, Arizmendi and seemingly endless row of brown sluggers by the name of Garcia. In the centre ring, throwing punches at the air, ducking and weaving as he crowded an imaginary opponent to the ropes was Arizmendi himself who seemed to have inherited not only the strong, stoic face of an Asian Aztec, but the courage and endurance as well. Bud Schilberg wrote, At the Main Street gym, Henry looked right over. He was a handsome giant of a man, with snow-white hair, bright blue eyes, and an accent that was pure Kentucky, despite a lifetime roaming around places like Alaska, the Philippines, Panama and New York City. He was a fight manager, who once slugged a referee and when called before the California Athletic Commission, he turned the tables, placed the poor referee in the role of defendant and finished up defending him. They called him one shot around the gyms and he had a weakness for heavyweights, but he could never find another Dempsey or Joe Lewis. He did find Haystack Sloan, for whom he invented the ice tongue punch, but Haystack couldn't fight not even with real ice tongs in his mitt. The best fighter Ross ever had was a little black kid he picked up at the Main Street gym in Los Angeles for $250. The kid's name was Henry Armstrong. Ross said, Undress the little shaver, stick him on the scales and let's see what I've got here. 
the scales registered £124.5. Henry made the £118 limit for the Olympic trials in San Francisco. Ross listened to the tale of torments and drying out then said, He's still a growing kid. You ought to allow his weight to take care of itself. You don't have to lose weight to fight. And if he has to fight heavier men, we'll build him up. But we aren't going to pull pounds off him for anybody. That's bad for a growing boy. Joe Gans died on account of cutting weight. Well, Henry was impressed with his manager. And as Bud Schulberg wrote, he thought to himself, I'm on the right track now. This man knows his business. I'm going to stick with him. And Henry went on to make his second professional debut at the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles against a guy called Eddie Trigilio. But after flooring the more experienced fighter in the first round, he lost a decision over four rounds, earning $50 and an ovation from the paying public. Four weeks later, Henry was overmatched against a guy called Al Greenfield, losing another decision. His professional record as Henry Armstrong was now 0-2. His professional career altogether as Henry Jackson and Armstrong was 1-3. and three. Now you would think that maybe boxing, he, he just wasn't cut out for Henry. But he persevered and lost only one fight in 1933. He fought good, experienced pros like Perfecto Lopez, a win and two draws, and Kid Morrow, two draws over 10 rounds. His sole loss to baby Manuel took his career record to an average 17 wins, five losses and five draws. But he began to fill out and his man strength was coming to the forefront. On January 26, 1934, Henry reversed a defeat against baby Manuel in Los Angeles actually taken a 10-round decision in Sacramento, the third 10-rounder in his early career. And the rematch was actually described by the Reno Evening Gazette, and they actually reported that Armstrong, weighing 131 pounds, walloped and weaved his way to a 10-round decision over baby Manuel, who was 26 pounds from Florida, here last night. Manuel, crafty on defence, seemed to lack aggressiveness and punch and he was far in arrears at the final belt it was his first loss in california in more than a dozen fights henry armstrong continued his rivalry with perfecto lopez in 1934 fighting the mexican four times three on points he won and one by a fifth round stoppage now before the impressive stoppage win in California, newspapers were already calling Henry the state featherweight champion. And it said that champ fights Lopez tonight in their headline. Before Henry took on Joe Sanchez on September the 7th, 1934, the Oxnard Daily Courier wrote, Henry Armstrong is a real tough boy, according to a statement made recently by his manager. And it is entirely possible that the manager isn't exaggerating things in the least. Henry is due to meet Joe Sanchez next Friday at the Ventura Athletic Club in the main event and we believe that this will really be a fight. Joe seems to be in pretty good condition and has a lot of friends who will be in his corner. On the other hand, there are a few of the gang who think he is not so hot. For instance, Baby Palmore, when he heard about this match, had his first good laugh in six bumps and promptly reserved himself a ringside seat in order to see his old rival take a beating. Joe isn't so sure he is going to be beaten. However, Armstrong's manager says, This Armstrong is the greatest club fighter and the most aggressive two-handed fighter in the world. It's a broad statement, all right, but we are willing to be shown, and it ought to be a good fight. Well, baby Palmore had his good laugh, and Armstrong had his knockout. Four rounds. Henry had become a real crowd pleaser, which earned him some decent money, enough for him to buy a pitch on the street and run his own shoe shining store. Harry brought one too, on the next block down, and together they were then able to rent a fully furnished apartment and purchase a radio. Although Henry was fighting in California, the circuit he fought on was super tough, where he fought predominantly Mexican and Filipino fighters. As 1934 closed, 
Henry, fighting under Armstrong, had improved his career substantially. He had now fought 39 times for one-shot Ross and won 29, 15 of which came by knockout. He drew six and he'd lost four. Certainly on the rise and one of those defeats was to the Mexican, uh, who will be mentioned in this throughout, but it's Alberto Baby Arismendi. Now, he was a huge favourite with the fans, and this was also the birth of a tremendously popular rivalry. Arismendi, at this point in his career, had been hugely successful, although only 21. He had already claimed the California and the California Mexican featherweight titles before finally landing the more prestigious New York State Athletic Commission featherweight crown on August the 30th, 1934, when he outpointed Mike Belwars over 15 rounds. It was during that summer that Henry, now 24, actually married Wilma May Shandy, a pastor's daughter, and asked his manager Ross to start making him some real money and put him in some big fights. Now, in his autobiography, Henry actually recalled a moment. He said, one day, Ross brought good news. He had arranged a 10-round engagement with Baby Arismendi in Mexico City on the 3rd of November, 1934. Henry asked, he's the fellow who just won the New York State Athletic Commission, calls the championship of the world, isn't he? And Ross answered, sure, and you're guaranteed $1,500 plus a percentage of the gate for the fight. Well, the Mexico City fans are crazy to see their boy in action. That's what Ross said. So Ross accompanied Henry Armstrong to Mexico City. And when they arrived by train, Armstrong was welcomed to the city like nothing he had ever seen before. Not only were there la- large crowds and newspaper headlines on the fight, but a plane also flew over the city carrying a welcome Henry banners, believe it or not. However... This fight was not what it seemed. And when they arrived at the Hotel Cosmos, Ross told Henry Armstrong, don't get too anxious and ambitious, son. You're not supposed to win this fight. When Henry asked what he meant, Ross tried to calm him down. Well, Henry, he said, I gave my word that we would fight the way Arismendi's manager wanted it. It was the only way I could get you signed. Just fight to go the full 10 rounds. Henry felt that he had done more than just go the 10 rounds in front of a raucous crowd of 25,000 fans at the National Stadium. He believed that he was a sure winner. However, the decision went to the home fighter and the headlines read the next day, Baby Arismendi is the easy winner and the United Press International reported Arismendi's superior boxing and effective body punching enabled him to win almost every round. Fighting with a broken left wrist from the second round, Arismendi gave one of the most courageous exhibitions in Mexican ring history. Nat Fleischer wrote in his article, Black Dynamite Volume 2, That's the contest, where the promoters ran off with the gate receipts and poor Henry and brother Harry were left stranded for three months. Dame Fortune seemed to be against the brothers there, for in addition to losing their guarantee, Henry became ill with the Mexican gripe, and he had to remain inactive for a month. When over his ailment, Ross got Henry a fight with Joe Conde, and he knocked Joe cold in seven rounds. Ventura Arana fancied his chance and was stopped in five rounds. This was better for Henry. The promoter decided to put Armstrong back in with Arismendi, this time over 12 rounds. There were two featherweight champions during this time. The National Boxing Association had Freddie Miller as their champion, but Baby Arismendi held the New York State Athletic Commission title and was considered to be the more legitimate version of the champion in the division. However, there was only one way to find out, and that was to schedule an undisputed title fight. This fight, for whatever reason, failed to materialise, so that opened the door for Henry Armstrong which was demanded by the press and public, although it was going to be another non-title fight. So Henry told the good news to Tony Rocker, his Mexican trainer, who jumped for joy and said, we train hard for these baby Henry, and these time you beat him, kid. So while in training, 
Henry wondered if Ross had made another arrangement that would make sure that he took it easy on the champion and last only the distance, but he refused to answer that question. That was until Henry was in the dressing room just before the bout, uh, just before he's about to make his ring walk. Then Ross finally confessed and he says, I guess you wonder about things, Henry. Matter of fact, I agreed that you would let Arismendi go the full distance this time like he did the first. But this time, we're giving no ground. I want you to go in there and beat him. That was fine with Henry, who said to himself, I'll beat the babe's ears off, no matter what kind of deal is cooked up. But on January the 1st, 1935, New Year's Day, in Mexico City, at the ball ring, El Torio de Cucho Caminos, where many bloody battles between men and bull had gone before, Henry Armstrong was ready to take the role as Manador against the brilliant Arismendi in front of the pro-Mexican crowd of 20,000. Author John Jurett sums up the second fight perfectly. He wrote, They met in the centre of the ring like two stags, head to head, gloves fudding home as the roar of the crowd increased in crescendo. Armstrong powered forward on his spindly legs, bobbing, weaving, forcing the action, three minutes every round, and the Mexicans knew he had a tiger by the tail. Armstrong and Arizmendi fought over every square inch of the ring of the 12 battering rounds. Cuts were opened and blood flowed freely. At the end, they were both stained red and dripping. But once again, Henry Armstrong thought he had done enough to take the win, but Arizmendi was given the verdict. However, this time the Mexican papers gave Henry a lot more credit. Many felt a draw was more justified. Another defeat for Armstrong was a bitter pill to swallow, considering how hard he had fought. But those that witnessed his performance knew he had all the markings of being a future world champion, and he also picked up a tidy sum for all his efforts. The money would have been a handy consolation, considering that he was expecting a baby girl in the February. In his autobiography, it was explained that Henry felt his sense of family responsibility more than ever, and the determination to make solid advances in his work. He regarded fighting as his profession and had a professional's concern for his career. His family of dependents increased when he brought his father and grandmother from St. Louis to live at his home in Los Angeles. Following the birth of his daughter, Henry headed back to Mexico City to take on another baby, baby Rodolfo Casanova. Many sources indicated that Armstrong smashed this baby all over the ring for four rounds, but a body shot that looked to be a fair punch which put Casanova down was claimed to be a foul. The referee agreed with Baby, who made a meal of it, obviously looking for a way out of the beating he was sustaining, and Armstrong was disqualified. A second round knockout in early March was followed by another fight in Mexico, and wouldn't you know it, Armstrong dropped another decision loss that same month against Davy Abad. Now clearly pissed off with Mexican officials, he asked Ross to match him in fights on home turf from now on, in the hope that he would be given a fairer crack at the whip. He was lined up with a tough fight against Tully Corvo at the L Street Arena in Sacramento. This was advertised as being for the state featherweight championship and Armstrong finally entered the ring as a fan favourite. And he didn't disappoint and Henry won every minute of every round before knocking out his opponent in five rounds. Four victories on the spin followed from April to June 1935 before Henry was matched against Alton Black for the Western Featherweight title at the Chestnut Street Arena in Reno. The Nevada State Journal wrote, With the ease and style that has marked him number one caliber for the world's featherweight title, the Los Angeles Negro never took a back step during the slashing main event. The Californian drew blood from an old cut over Black's left eye in the third round and opened a deep cut under the same eye in the fourth. He never stopped pegging away until the Reno fighter's face was a bloody pulp. The fight could have been stopped in the fifth round and there would have been no decession on the ringside. On the other hand, the Reno youth put up a bitter battle. He continuously rocked the southerner with straight rights and lefts. 
The fight opened at a terrific pace and never once palled. The first round was an easy draw, with Black taking the second and third by a slim margin. Armstrong opened up again in the fourth, and then from then on, the Reno boxer did not have a chance. The Negro fighter displayed a rare ability, and he took some terrific punishment before Tony Polino, referee, raised his arm at the close of the eighth frame. Henry was handed a handsome silver belt buckle, which he would always continue to wear as an award for his impressive performance. He would meet Black again in his last fight in 1935. It ended in the same round with the same outcome. Armstrong was now the king of the featherweights, or on the west side of the Mississippi River in a way. A couple of months before his second impressive victory against Black, Alan Ward wrote in the Oakland Tribune, It has been claimed, with sufficient emphasis and repetition, to give the assertion a brand of truth that Mexico City is the Saragosso Sea of pugilism, so far as invading fighters are concerned. Outside scrappers just can't seem to get ahead in Mexico City. This realisation, formulated many moons ago, tends to establish Henry Armstrong, an excellent ringman, despite a record compiled and forwarded by manager One Shot Wirt Ross, which lists two defeats in the capital of the land of Manana. One of the losses was to Davy Abad, previously licked by Armstrong. The other was to Baby Arizmendi, New York's featherweight champion. If Ross's allegations are to be accepted, both Freddie Miller, NBA champion, and Arizmendi are fearful of meeting Armstrong with their titles at stake. Ross's elaborate advertising brochures led off with a splash of red ink, with the promise to pay $5,000 to anyone who will deliver either of them into an arena at fight time. On November 27th, 1935, Armstrong came up against a legend of the sport who had lost the New York State Athletic Commission flyweight title two months earlier against Small Montana, and that was a Philadelphian born as Joseph Robert Moscalzo, but known by many as Midget Walgast. Now, although Walgast took the larger share of the purse due to his already established career, Henry was more interested in enhancing his own reputation and career with a victory rather than increasing his bank balance. He dropped Walgast with a right uppercut in the second round. And Midget came back strong in the next, making it an even fight up to the ninth round. However, Henry's strong rally in the ninth and tenth combined with the knockdown, gave Henry Armstrong the decision. Great win and Henry kick-started 1936, clearly feeling positive because he agreed a fight or to fight a rematch against Joe Conde in Mexico, a guy he had knocked out in between the Arizmendi defeats. It was bad judgment on his and his management team's part because once again Armstrong lost a 10-round decision. His next two bouts came against Richie Fontaine, the first at the auditorium in Oakland. There were no excuses to be made for this result as Fontaine came out the winner and rightly so on many accounts. But it was as explained by Alan Ward in the Oakland Tribune, for bruising toe-to-toe head-to-head exchanges, the battle of the overgrown featherweights was in a class by itself. So, due to how entertaining this first fight was, although obviously Armstrong was on the wrong end of the result, Los Angeles promoters pulled the two guys back for a rematch nearly five weeks later. This time it was at the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles. And it was the Los Angeles Times that felt that Armstrong won six rounds and Fontaine four rounds, who sustained a cut on his forehead from an accidental clash of heads. Armstrong's right eye was puffed at the end of the bout, but he correctly took the decision and the revenge. And the Los Angeles Daily News reported that Armstrong nearly floored Fontaine with a right to the jaw in the second round and went on to win the next two rounds by a wide margin. The Daily News was another paper that covered the fight and they favoured Armstrong 6-2-2 two to two in rounds. Now this quick bit of revenge caught the eye of the powers that be, forcing the Montana Helena Independent to declare Armstrong has been given consideration by the New York Boxing Commission 
as a candidate for the World Featherweight Championship title from which Baby Ares Mender recently was oust. And such chances are not running around loose. The game Fontaine weathered two ferocious rounds in which he took much punishment. One shot Ross then announced, I've got you definitely signed my boy to meet Arismendi August 4th at Wrigley Field in Los Angeles. I want you to go in to serious training my boy to meet Arismendi. This is an important fight. Not going to have any others until this is over. If you win, you'll be the world's champion as far as Mexico and New York State are concerned. And California too. Henry asked baffled, California? Sure, said Ross smiling. The Californian Athletic Commission just recognised Arismendi as featherweight champion of the world. Far as the money is concerned, that makes the babe world's champion for fair. You know, the money fights are mostly in New York, and for this fight with Arismendi, I've got us the largest guarantee we've had yet. Yes, my boy, $2,000. How would you like that? Just fine, said Henry. If I ever wanted a fight, this is it. Both fighters trained at the Main Street gym and fans packed out the joint, paying 10 cents entry fees just to see the fighters working out. When it came to fight night, Henry wasn't going to allow anyone to take this opportunity away from him. He knew he had to dominate the fight or stop Arismendi, even though the fight was held in Los Angeles at Wrigley Field. In fact, there were more Mexicans living in Los Angeles than any other city in Mexico, barring Mexico City. The Washington Evening Star wrote, Baby Arismendi of Mexico City today was 126 pounds of human hamburger following a 10-round scrap with Henry Armstrong of St. Louis for the California-New York Featherweight Boxing Championship. Armstrong gave Arismendi a thorough beating, keeping him plastered against the ropes and flailing with both fists from the first bell to the last. So the Washington Evening Star continued, it said, on only two occasions was Arizmendi able to fight his way to the centre of the ring and staged the lightning rallies that have characterised his attack in the past. He came closest to winning a round when he fought his way out from the ropes in the fifth. The Mexican, who is accustomed to taking the lead himself, was unable to escape the bronze shadow and mercilessly was outclassed. P.T. Saron, who was the uh, NBA featherweight champion at the time, actually sat ringside watching on in absolute disbelief. And one reporter actually wrote that his face was Asian white, an empty ache in the pit of his stomach. He squirmed in his seat and choked as he watched Henry Armstrong hammer baby Arismendi into the most brutal, ruthless defeat in his brilliant 11-year stretch of ring warfare last night at Ringley Field. Saren even turned to his neighbours at ringside and openly admitted, I'm glad I'm not in there with Henry Armstrong tonight. Also at ringside was singer Al Jolson and his wife, a movie star, Ruby Keeler. Now, in his 1988 book, Jolson the Legend, Herb Goldman actually told a story, and this is what he said. He said, with them was friend Eddie Mead, a fight manager who was a friend of Ruby's from her chorus days in New York. Now, as the fight progressed, Ruby actually turned to Mead and said, that's the kind of fight you ought to manage, Eddie. That boy Armstrong. There's just 5,000 reasons why I ain't managing him, replied Mead. I can buy him for five grand. And all I need is $4,995,000 more to make that deal. But when the fight was over, Al gave Mead his card and he told him to call him the next day. Al agreed to finance Mead's purchase of Henry Armstrong's contract with Rick Ross. Mead, anxious for publicity, got Jolie's OK to tell Jack Singer of the Los Angeles Times that the sale price was $10,000 instead of $5,000. It proved to be a bad move. Ross raised the price to $10,000 as soon as he saw Singer's story. Al was furious and absolutely refused to give Meade the additional $5,000. It was clear that Henry Armstrong was now hot property. He had dethroned the brilliant Arismendi, who many considered to be the best featherweight in the world, 
collecting the California Mexico featherweight title and a tidy sum of $2,000. In Henry's autobiography, he explained that Meade was still chasing the extra five grand, so he approached George Raft. Before Raft had become a film star, he had done some fighting under Meade's wing. Meade said, Raft readily advanced the money. Henry didn't know till a good while later that Raft had supplied half of Meade's payment in purchase of the contract. But Henry did learn soon that George Raft of the films was a warm friend and a helpful one. Raft remained a silent partner in the transaction. Jolson was credited by the papers with having advanced the full amount. Ross got his 10 grand and Eddie Meade got Henry. Things began to happen fast. Within a few days, Meade announced he had matched Henry against Mike Beloy to go 10 rounds in Los Angeles on 27th of October 1936. This was pretty fast work and Henry felt increased confidence in his new manager. His new manager, Eddie Meade, was described by Art Cohn, sports editor of the Oakland Tribune, as a fat man. By fat, I mean he weighed 300 pounds and every ounce of it was happy. The Los Angeles Times gave their scores on the fight against Beloy at the Olympic Auditorium on October 27th, 1936, which was Armstrong by seven rounds, Beloy won with two even. The LA Times then went on to explain that Armstrong fought in his usual manner, crowding his opponent and throwing punches at close range. Belois's best round was the fourth when he scored heavily with a right uppercut. Armstrong frequently had Belwar in, in retreat and punished him along the ropes. The Los Angeles Daily News had the bout closer, giving Armstrong five rounds, Belwar four, uh, with one even. And the Daily News felt Armstrong was troubled by Belwar, who actually threw punches with abundant. Now, R.A. Cronin of the Daily News felt that the ninth round was one of the best rounds he had actually ever seen in this decade. It was a great fight. The Daily News quoted Belwar saying that Armstrong beat me and he was entitled to the decision. So thinking that he was now considered to be the New York State Athletic Commission heavyweight champion following his victory, he was actually left disappointed because a few days later, the New York Boxing Commission decided not to recognise him as champion because the fight with Belwar was actually only a 10-rounder. Recognition would be given only if he defeated Belwar in a second fight over 15 rounds in New York City. Therefore, the New York State Athletic Commission would continue to recognise Belwar as the world featherweight champion, despite his loss to Armstrong. John J. Phelan, chairman of the commission, actually came out in the papers and explained that the bald recognises bouts scheduled for 15 rounds as championship encounters and that titles are not at stake in fights over shorter routes. So that was the rule. So it's back to the grindstone, back to the drawing board for Henry, who then had two fights in November, one via a first round knockout in Los Angeles and the other when his opponent actually retired in his corner during a visit to St. Louis, Missouri. He fought in the same venue the money support auditorium in St. Louis in his next fight. But it didn't quite go to plan, or as he as explained in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. The newspaper wrote, Armstrong appeared to be wearing down Tony Chavez when the foul came and had him in trouble in the eighth round from a left right to the head. The foul, coming at the end of the round, was an unintentional low blow that dropped Chavez. Chavez rolled over and out of the ring where he was helped back into the ring and later carried to his dressing room. Armstrong was disqualified for the second time in his career, but from the description, it was clear to see that the opponent, Chavez, from Albuquerque, was looking for an easy route out. So to start the year, Henry then travelled to Mexico City, a place that had not been kind to Henry on the scoring department, but he made sure the judges were not needed, as he knocked out his opponent, baby Rodolfo Casanova in three rounds. Ironically, this was the same fighter who had also bowed out of the ring in their first fight winning by disqualification. So this was the justice gained for the American this time round. 
Now, after completing a revenge mission against Casanova, he completed the double in the same month, January 1937, when he knocked out Tony Chavez in the 10th and final round back at the Olympic Auditorium. Two fights and two knockouts followed in February. Moon Mullins was the first on the second of the month, and then Varas Milling was sparked out in the fourth round on the 19th of February. In fact, the Mullins knockout was one of his career best punches, as he described in March 1937 when he said, I hit Mullins so hard, he actually skidded before going down. Pow! He was out, just like a steer you hit with a hammer in the stockyards. Now, before the Beloy fight, which was scheduled for March 12, 1937, Henry took on California Joe Rivers 10 days before at the Olympic Auditorium. 10 days before potential title fight incredible so after bashing his opponent around the ring for four ruthless rounds the rivers corner threw in a towel saving their man for another day now it was the second fight with belize which was henry's first fight on the east coast and his debut at madison square garden as well and john lardner actually wrote in his column and do please forgive the language well his description of henry armstrong is politically incorrect as of these days but this is just a sign of the times and this is what he wrote he said next to his mammy and his sunny boy Al Jolson's favourite person in a coffee coloured little negro named Henry Armstrong Mr Jolson owns a generous piece of Armstrong's torso and believes that young Henry will sooner or later be the featherweight or lightweight champion of the world or something terrific colossal a Thunderbolt, a new Gans, a new Dixon, a new Walcott, a Black McGurvin. Those were the things the critics call Armstrong on the coast. His friends call him Henry. The Thunderbolt will make his Eastern debut this week against Mike Belize, a substitute for the in- injured Aldo Spilodi, and the heaviest weight on his shoulders will be his coast's reputation. Armstrong looks all right in training. Armstrong is a hooker. He wades in in straight lines with his arms cocked low. His speed protects him from punishment. He can see a punch coming, slip it and bury his head in your midriff with considerable effect. Though he is only 24 years old, the kid has compiled a very fair record for freestyle savagery in the ring. He has beaten Belize and Baby Arizmendi both of whom were recognised at one time or another and simultaneously as the featherweight champions of the world. Of course, Mike and the baby were courtesy champions with no legal claim to the title whatsoever. But what does alter the fact that Armstrong beat both of them? He is now recognised in certain counties, one-armed restaurants and private estates, including Mr Al Jolson's, as the one and only champion of the world. Mike Belwar still held the New York State Athletic Commission title, but although the commission had sanctioned the bout, it was once again a 10-rounder, so the belt was not on the line, as we explained earlier. This was still a mammoth opportunity for Armstrong to showcase his skills and show the East Coast what he was all about. Henry McLemore, who covered the fight for the United Press, described Henry's lack status in New York going into the rematch and how, on occasion, the hype surrounding the fighters from the West Coast wasn't always accurate. And he said, Los Angeles said he was terrific, stupendous, colossal and a surefire killer. But Los Angeles is always saying that about something, so nobody believed it. In Henry's autobiography, it described that when he walked down the aisle of the garden, it was half empty and so cold. He shivered, lacking the fancy robes usual in the garden. He entered the ring with his old amateur boxing shoes and a ragged robe, looking like a tramp and just about the loneliest and most nervous man in the world. His legs were as thin as pipe stems and he was very small, 127 pounds. For the first time in his life, he knew real fear. Then something happened that Henry will never forget if he lives to be a 100. A man got up out of a ringside seat near his corner and reached up for his hand. It was George Raft, and this is what George said as he held Henry's hand. Hank, old boy, we've got to win for California tonight. New courage flowed into Henry. He actually laughed and said, we'll win. 
Henry McClenmore described the action and the moment that they all realised that Los Angeles were not just pushing the envelope on an average fighter. So Henry McLemore wrote that Henry Armstrong came out of the crouch. He threw a left hook flush against the jaw of Mike Belwar, featherweight champion in the world. It was a short left hook. Didn't travel more than a foot at the most, but a bomb couldn't have been more effective. So Belwar was paralysed for a moment and then gave all way all over and pitched foot on his face in the Madison Square Garden's ring. He was out of his head for an hour and a half. McLemore then said that Armstrong, sitting in his dressing room, talked of the fight in a quiet voice. I knew I had him almost ready for the kill in the third round. I let him have a right and a full right under the heart. He sagged, and I guess he would have gone down if it hadn't been for them ropes. I knew then the finish would come in the fourth. So from the end of March... To June 15, 1937, Henry Armstrong fought six times. He won five by knockout and took a one 10-round decision against Aldo Sepaldi. The first time, and the first time someone had taken a dis- distance in a quite remarkable succession of knockout victories that would actually last until March 1938. So literally after this Sepaldi fight, he will go on a crazy knockout spree. And Sepaldi then said years later that he now knows why he went the distance and the reason for that against Henry Armstrong. He said, being Italian, I have a hard head. Mamma mia, I'll tell you. I was very lucky. It was my best fight. I took everything he was giving me. I was one of the few when Henry Armstrong was at his best that was still standing up until the last goal. On July 8th, Henry demolished Alf Blatch at Madison Square Garden. And the New York Times reported that his opponent was floored eight times before the referee halted the bout in round three. Ten days later, the referee had to put a stop to Henry's beating of Lou Massey after four rounds. So they had to step up the level of opposition. And he was matched with the excellent Benny Bass at the Baker Bowl in Philadelphia on July 27th, 1937. The Philadelphia Inquirer wrote Armstrong dominated from the start. In the fourth round, Armstrong drove Bass to the ropes with two right hands. With his back against the ropes, Armstrong landed three more right hooks and Bass crashed to the canvas. Bass landed on his side and attempted to regain his feet, just missing the 10 count. This was the only time in Bass's career that he was counted out. Now if there was ever any doubt that Henry Armstrong was not the legitimate best featherweight in the world, then this victory over Bass proved it. The little fish, as they called him, was never knocked off his feet in almost 200 fights. The closest any other fighter came was Kid Chocolate in 1931. Henry fought three times in August, three times in September and began October with another fight. Each and every opponent was knocked out or stopped in less than five rounds. Henry Armstrong was a beast, yet although he was considered to be the best featherweight in the world in 1937, it was still not legitimate he would need to beat Pete Saron, who held the NBA version for him to get worldwide recognition. It was Daniel M. Daniel who wrote The Jacob Story in 1949, who actually best explains how these two champions finally got the chance to meet. He wrote of a discussion between the new Madison Square Garden promoter, Uncle Mike Jacobs, had with Nat Fleischer, the ring editor. This was going to be Jacobs' first promotion at the Garden, and he identified the featherweight unification fight as a real money spinner. So Nat explained to Mike that Peter Suron had been doing remarkable things in England and South Africa as the standout, as the standout featherweight at the time. Now, Suron's rates were regarded as too steep by American promoters. I was told Saron gets $15,000 every time he starts in South Africa. Why can't you pay him that much? And Jacobs replied, you're asking me to break into the garden with a loss. Eddie Mead, Armstrong's manager, demands 20% with a minimum of seven grand. If I give Saron 15 grand, I can't make a showing at the gate. Flyger said, I told Mike that he would have to take the risk. Half an hour later, he called me back. Are you authorised to sign for Saron? 
I assured him that I, I had that authority. Here is a contract for Saren to fight Armstrong for the World Featherweight Championship for $15,000, Jacob snorted. Too much dope, however, sign it. Before Nat signed the contract, he read it and queried the clause stating that Saren would fight only for Jacob for three years. Jacob's replied, Nat, this contract is a type of agreement. They will sign for me or they won't fight for the 20th Century Sporting Club. That is how I'm going to do business in the garden. I am the promoter. I have signed up Armstrong for three years. I have a long-term call on the services of Joe Lewis. Nat then said, Jacobs had his way. Saren was signed up for three-year exclusive. So Saren and Nat, with his $15,000, he agreed to take on Henry Armstrong at Madison Square Garden on October the 29th, 1937. Stanley Weston, who wrote Boxing and Wrestling, explained, on paper, Saren didn't have a chance. Armstrong was going like a house on fire, knocking over everyone they threw his way. And Hank was a pocket-sized Harry Greb, he called him. He never stopped moving in and throwing leather. Stanley Weston continued to explain Henry's style, saying that he would tuck his chin down under his left shoulder. He kept crowding in, slamming rights and lefts. If he didn't knock them out, they dropped from sheer exhaustion. Henry was making the 126-pound limit with ease. He came in 124 and a half on the day of the fight and looked in terrific physical shape. In his corner for the biggest fight of his career was Harry Armstrong, Eddie Mead and Frank Doc Bagley, who you may remember from our Gene Tunney and Jack Dempsey Legendary Nights episode. Eddie Brights of the Daily Globe explained the details best when he wrote, A crowd of 14,000, of whom 11,847 parted with $34,708 to welcome Mike Jacobs in the garden and see Armstrong, in many respects, a miniature edition of Joe Lewis, hang up his 22nd knockout in his last 23 fights. The knockout climaxed five of the fastest, most furiously fought rounds garden fans have seen in years. Saron, off to a dazzling lead, blew it in the fifth and sixth when Armstrong finally got organised and began to go to town. A crushing left to the pit of the stomach, quickly followed by a murderous right flush to the button, polished off the game and clever Saron after almost six rounds of sterling milling in the garden. Saron admitted after the fight, those two blows hurt me, but not so badly that I couldn't have got up. I missed one of the referee's counts. I was looking for nine when he said ten. Saron's manager, Jim Irwin, said in the dressing room after the fight, I think I will make a lightweight out of Peter. I doubt if he'll ever try to make £126 again. It takes too much out of him. Well, the trouble for them, and the trouble for Saron was, that Henry was already decided that he's going to move up, he's going to concentrate on the lightweight and weight titles after this. So the scenes after the, after finally winning his first world title, the featherweight world title, were actually described in Henry's autobiography. And it said in the dressing room, he was besieged by reporters and press photographers. There were questions and flashbulbs popping, all mixed in together. Finally, they left and Henry was in a daze. Harry had his innings now. He was widely enthusiastic. You're in, kid. You've done it, a real champ. Those are kid chocolate shoes you're wearing now. Be sure you take good care of them. Mead, well, he remained calm outwardly, but Henry could tell that he was delighted deep down inside. It was the second champ for him. The other had been California's Joe Lynch. And Mead told Harry, give Henry an Epsom salts bath before he goes to his Harlem party. And try to get him to bed before it's too far tomorrow noon. Harry promised he'd perform according to instructions. All well, the celebrations at the club plantation and a Harlem play spot. Henry dully bathed and feeling great found his wife and a crowd of friends waiting for him there. That night he tasted as never before the fruits of his victory. He was hero worship for fair. From the moment that a Roll of drums in the band announced his arrival. 
until he left hours later. So Henry took extended leave after the Sauron fight. Well, a full 21 days anyway, if you want to call that leave, before he started to feel the itch again, telling Meade that he felt rusty and he needed to get back in the ring again. But Meade informed his enthusiastic fire and champion, you're a champion now. You can't fight every week. It will cheapen the title. Why don't you run over to the gym and bang your head on the big bag a couple of times? Maybe that'll make you feel better. Henry laughed at Meade and then apologised for complaining before heading over to Stillman's gym and boxed for 10 rounds with four different guys, a lightweight and three welterweights. Boxing writer Barney Nagler explained in his article for The Ring Henry's dramatic rise and he wrote, By the time we got to know Meade, Armstrong's purses had put him in the chips. He was hanging out in good saloons away from his old haunts on the west side and had more than one suit of clothes to his name. He was a blubbery bon vivant with a round, soft face that had the mild look of a kid surprised with his hand in the cookie jar. He went to his pocket easily and lived at a pace only hustlers can set and only millionaires can afford. Armstrong did confirm to a newspaper around this time that he had earned $90,000 in 1937, in Henry's first fight after knocking out Saron to become world champion, he was matched with the New Jersey lightweight champion, Billy Bohold, who had been undefeated in 44 fights. It was no match for Armstrong, who described this fight as another one of his favourite knockout punches, and it also demonstrated just how powerful he was when he said, I was fighting a highly advertised knockout artist named Billy Bohold. In the fifth round, I hit him with an overhand right just back of the ear, so hard that he flipped mid-air on the way down. It was a shame because Billy was a very promising fighter. Gary Tolbert reported from ringside that night, suggesting that the current lightweight champion, Lou Ambers, would keep his title only if he stays away so long as he's managed to stay out of the same ring as Henry Armstrong. He then went on to explain that not only does he have ridiculously impressive power, but his chin was just as solid. He said, they know now his jaw is as rocked ribbed as his fists. Yeah, Gary Talbot clarified this, his opinion, saying that uh, Bohold stood up and smashed him with everything in the book and Armstrong only grinned wider and tore in harder. He didn't take one backward step and he must have thrown 500 punches in five rounds. Even veteran writer Hype Igor wrote, calling Lou Ambers and Barney Ross, and telling them fair that a dark shadow flitters around their cabin doors. Henry Armstrong is still the terror of the little men of Vistiana, and it is up to Lou and Barney to do something about it. Henry was coming for them all, and after stopping three more opponents to end 1937, Armstrong had scored 25 knockouts in 26 fights. He was the official world featherweight champion and named the Ring Magazine Fighter of the Year over a certain Joe Lewis as well. So Henry kickstarted 1938 with a, another impressive knockout of an Italian lightweight called Enrico Venturi, inspiring Nat Fleischer to write this article. Um, the, the Black Dynamite Volume 2 and this is what he said he said having taken the measure of one of the outstanding lightweights in Venturi and another in Bohode Armstrong was convinced that he would or could whip Lou Ambers to win the lightweight championship he started a hot campaign to get that match but found Hermica Lou less than enthusiastic for such a bout Al Will was Lou's manager and he wanted to wait for an outdoor match that would generate plenty of money. And while dodging the issue, Barney Ross sneaked in and got the assignment with Armstrong for a world welterweight championship match. That's the featherweight king versus the welterweight king. A handicap match that set a record in that it was the first of its kind in the history of American pugilism. Mike Jacobs agreed to stage the fight at Madison Square Garden Bowl in Long Island on May 26, 1938, uh, which actually gave Henry plenty of time to prepare for this fight. In fact, listen to this, from January to March, 
he would incredibly fight nine more times, eight of which would end in less than five rounds. There were two standout performances within those down fights. The first was against Chalky Wright, who would become the king of the feathers by the early 1940s, a guy who would go on to fight over 200 times and knock out half of them. The Los Angeles Times reported on this fight, which took place at the Olympic Auditorium on February the 1st, 1938, and it reads, Armstrong charged right all over the ring, but he avoided any trouble as he covered up effectively. Armstrong continued his attack in the second round, and in the middle of the round he trapped right in a neutral corner and unleashed an attack with both hands that sank him to the canvas for a two count. In the third, a right to the chin sent right to his knees, for no count, but after he rose, Armstrong staggered him with a left that then sent him reeling across the ring. Armstrong followed with another flurry, punctuated by a right cross to the jaw that floored right for a third time. Chalky Wright attempted to beat the count, but was up just after the ten count had been told. This was the third time Chalky had been knocked out in well over 100 fights. One of the other fighters to have achieved this feat was Baby Arismendi, the other significant victory in this nine-fight sequence. According to the Los Angeles Times, Arismendi stood toe-to-toe with Armstrong the whole fight, but by the fifth round his right eye was swollen shut. The same eye was cut in the eighth round as Arismendi finished the fight with blood streaming down his face. Referee George Blake and the two judges all scored about eight, one and one, in favour of Armstrong. The Los Angeles Daily News felt that Arismendi never seemed in trouble in the fight, but was unable to cope with the weaving and bobbing style of Armstrong. Clearly got a lot better now, Armstrong, and the Daily News scored the bout 6-2-2 two and two for Armstrong in their unofficial card. Uh, Henry's Mexican rival was the first to take in the distance in 12 months after he had swept across the country, leaving a trail of 27 shattered victims in his wake. Although Henry would have been disappointed not to have secured another knockout, especially against his most fierce rival, he would have been happy that he had levelled their four-fight series to two apiece. Now it was time for Henry to take the next step in his unbelievable career, and that was his scheduled fight against Barney Ross. Two weight classes above him, it's incredible. When Al Real actually received the news that the Armstrong-Ross fight had been signed, he actually resigned from his position as the acting matchmaker for Mike Jacobs at the 20th Century Sporting Club. It was explained in Henry's autobiography that powerful influences, probably inspired by Will, began shouting that Amber's rights to the lightweight title bout with Armstrong be protected. So it was agreed that Henry was to weigh in over the lightweight limit in his fight with Ross to protect Ambers and Ross was to weigh no more than 142 pounds at the time. So for the first time in the history of organised boxing, a featherweight champion was being permitted to take on the welterweight champion of the world. Henry stood to take Ross's title, but Ross could only gain a large purse if he won. One thing did worry Henry about the fight. He was a featherweight after all, fighting at 126 pounds. And here he was being thrown in against Ross for the 147 pound title. The law said Henry had to weigh within nine pounds of that weight at the weigh-in. So that's or 138 pounds he had to weigh. That meant that he had to put on a lot of weight somehow. He barely made featherweight. It's incredible. So Henry spoke to Ted Carroll at the ring office about the night before the Barney Ross fight. And this is what he recalled. I'll never forget the Ross fight. General feeling of the commission didn't want to okay the Ross match at first because he thought I was too small. But they finally convinced him I'd come in at £138. Meade had a gimmick for everything. So when we hit camp, he told me, look, kid. You're from St. Louis, where everybody goes for that Budweiser, and you're going to have to drink plenty of beer for this fight. Henry protested that he didn't even like beer, but Mead said, well, it's the only way in the world we can put on enough weight, so to save the Ross fight. With his belly full of Budweiser, Henry hit the scales on the morning of the fight, 
and weighed in three pounds under, so Eddie advised him to drink plenty of water, and Henry remembered. A funny thing about Eddie, he had a trick of standing behind me at weighing time, and just when everybody would be straining for a peep at the scale, he'd take two fingers and push me up in the back if I had to make weight, or he'd push me down on the shoulder with the same two fingers if I had to come in heavy. I don't know yet just how he did it, but he was a wizard at it. Well, at noon that day, I was the most waterlogged fighter who ever lived. It's a good thing that Ross wasn't a body puncher, because one punch in the belly and the ring would have been flooded. When I got on the scales, Eddie pulled his old magic finger act, and I hopped right off as the marker hit £139. Henry luckily got some reprieve due to the torrential rain that had postponed the fight for five days. Interestingly, the delay actually suited Henry because there were no more weigh-ins, and the special arrangements were cancelled. Well, what a touch for Henry. Uh, He must have felt at that moment that if there was a god, he was on his side. And we'll come to why we mentioned anything about God after this fight, because he tells a, a, an interesting story. But so the delay actually turned the odds against Barney Ross, because firstly, Henry wouldn't be bloated with beer, and and yet by this point, within five days, he trimmed himself down to his usual muscular frame. And also, interestingly, no champion had uh, ever retained his title at the Garden Bowl. So if he was a superstitious type, maybe that was a part of the reason. Yet the welterweight champ still remained the heavy favourite at 7-5. to five. You know, the press actually tried to hype the fight with the race card using Barney's father's murder by two African-American men as the reason. Terrible. But everyone knew that Barney was not that way inclined. He was good friends with all sorts of people from different ethnic backgrounds. So into the fight, and we're going to use a close friend of Barney Ross's for the details, who was a sports writer, and is someone we've, we've spoke about previously, Henry McLemore. And he wrote this for the United Press. So Ross will fight no more. He's through. He told me in his training camp that he would never take but one beating. Let a guy give it to me, really give me my bumps, and I'll hang up the gloves, Ross said. Well, a guy gave it to him last night. The guy is named Henry Armstrong. And he is 133 pounds of almost inhumane properties. Now, I say inhuman because a man is not supposed to behave the way Armstrong did last night. He went at a blistering top speed for 15 rounds. And he didn't even sweat. He threw 10,000 punts yet when he's his corner. Ready to come out for the final round, he wasn't even breathing heavily. I knew this to be true because the night was cold and I could see his breath in the frosty air. It was as regular as that of a man who had walked only a block or two at a brisk pace. He gave you the impression of being more a machine than a man. Cut his veins, I heard one spectator say, and he'll run lubricating oil, not blood. Yes, cut him open, and I am sure you'd find springs and coils and armatures and bits of metal. In the early rounds, Ross hit him plenty, but he never changed his expression. A right to the chin, and he only snorted a bit louder and moved in a bit faster. Punches to the body only seemed to set off a hidden power that drove him onto the attack at a faster pace. He fought every round the same from the 1st to the 15th. He was perpetual motion in purple trunks a buzzsaw with gloves on. It was nothing short of a beating. Barney's manager, Sam Pian, pleaded with Ross to stop the fight, but his response was defiant. I'm not quitting. If you stop the fight, I'll never talk to you again. He was desperate to finish the fight on his feet. Heading into the last rounds, Art Donovan told him that he was going to stop the fight because he wasn't protecting himself. But Barney again made it clear for the last time I'll never fight again after this one. I promise you that if you let me finish. The excellent Henry Armstrong, who had moved up two weight classes, demolished a living legend by a clear unanimous decision. 12 rounds to 2 on referee Arthur Donovan's card and 11 to 2 and 10 to 4 on the two judges' cards. Yes, Ross was a 10-year veteran at this point, 
but he was still also ranked highly and considered one of the best around at the time and the same age as Henry, 28. They say grown men cried that night, not because of what Henry had achieved, but because they had witnessed the fan favourite Barney Ross get battered for 15 rounds, but never give up. It was an eerily silence that fell over the crowd as Barney walked to his dressing room from the ring. And Barney said that the silence was deafening. 35,000 people were sitting in silence. And I suddenly realised that this unbelievable, fantastic silence was the most wonderful tribute I had ever received. Well, Barney Ross was much loved. And even Henry Armstrong later admitted to pulling his punches for the last few rounds just in pure respect for the welterweight champ. And we implored you, please go and check out a career profile on Barney Ross. A remarkable story and extraordinary life of this guy. Absolutely extraordinary. So... Following the Ross win, Henry actually went up to Harlem to celebrate at a local club where his fans had, had gathered. It was a night that he would never forget, but not because of the enormous pride that he must have felt to see so many people that wanted to congratulate their hero. But it was another moment recalled in his autobiography again, and this is how it was described. So, Henry said, The manager of the club welcomed him with open arms but as he walked through the club door he felt a strange touch on his shoulder he looked quickly round no man or woman had touched him it was something from out of this world something that rocked him out of nowhere out of the past out of the little cabin in the Columbus Mississippi came the words in his head as a child you must go over yonder and do great things don't forget that I am your God and maker. Remember. He still hears those words. He thinks of them, not as dream words from out of a dim, lost boyhood, but as words actually spoken. They came back to him word for word the night he whipped Barney Ross for the welterweight title in 1937, a haunting reminder that he was to be God's champion. Henry stood spellbound and speechless. The crowd was suddenly silent. They stood staring at him, wondering what he was doing. He turned to his host and asked to be excused for a moment to go alone in a quiet room, somewhere. Alone in a little room, he thanked God for his victory over Barney Ross and for all the other victories and for some explanation of why this had happened in this nightclub. Somehow, the party seemed pretty flat after that. Henry had things on his mind that the crowd could never understand. He was quiet. He went home early. He kept thinking, yep, you're the champ, but seems like I'm not champ enough for God. What's he want me to do anyway? Always, after that, he would steal away from the crowds at victory celebrations and pray a little. Henry Armstrong was now holding two world titles in two divisions, the featherweight and welterweight championships, the first man to ever do it. This alone had catapulted his stature from just another world champion to legendary status. Eddie Meade couldn't quite believe what his fighter had achieved, but now the most logical step was to force a fight with the lightweight champion, Lou Ambers. With Mike Jacobs on their side, it wasn't just about if it would happen, it was a matter of when. In Lester Bromberg's book, Boxing's Unforgettable Fights, Written in 1962, he recalled that Mike Jacobs was ready to talk to Al Wheel. For a purse of $32,000, Lou Ambers would defend his lightweight title against Mike's double champion, who would have to be happy with $25,000. Incredible, he gets less. Jacobs picked July 26th at the Yankee Stadium for Armstrong and Ambers. Soon he realised it was the wrong season for the ballpark attraction. But on the day of the fight, the promoter happily spotted four drops of rain. He promptly rescheduled the fight indoors. The new date was August 17, 1938. The place, Madison Square Garden. Then Gal Talbot wrote for the Kingsport Times. And he said, postponement from last Wednesday when rain doused a sparse gathering at the Polo Grounds. Henry Armstrong, Lou Amber's fight at Madison Square Garden Wednesday night 
may yet be a financial as well as an artistic success. Tickets selling at a faster clip than before the bout was transported to 8th Avenue Shelter and indications are that the gate will grow to $100,000. That is at least twice the amount that had been taken in before the rain came last week. So it's a good move to change the venue. So into the fight, and we will use the Times magazine's description of the fight. So a 3-1 to one underdog, champion Ambers in the early rounds did nothing to raise his reputation. Under a tattoo of blinding punches, he crumpled to the canvas at the end of the fifth round. Saved by the bell, he came out for the sixth, only to be knocked down again. But at the count of eight, just as the garden spectators and millions of radio listeners were mentally collecting their bets, underdog Ambers clambered to his feet. Somehow, Ambers kept on his feet through that round and the seventh and the eighth and the ninth and the tenth. The crowd went crazy. Barney Nagler then explained what happened after the tenth round for the Ring magazine. He said, throwing up with cuts inside, Ambers began cutting up Armstrong. The challenger was bleeding from a deep cut inside his mouth. His eyes were cut. His face was flecked with blood. And at the end of the 10th round, Billy Kavanagh, the referee, came to Armstrong's corner. And this is how the conversation has gone down in ring history. So Billy Kavanagh says to Henry Armstrong, I'm going to stop it, Henry. To which Armstrong replies, don't stop it, Mr. Kavanagh. I'm winning on points. I've had him down twice. The ring is full of blood. It's your blood. Then I'll stop the bleeding. I want this title. One more drop of blood on the canvas and I'll stop it. But when the referee left the corner, Armstrong told Meade, don't put my mouthpiece in. I've got to swallow this blood. If it shows, he'll stop it. The Times magazine described the championship rounds like this. By the 13th, when he, as in Ambers, plainly got the better of Armstrong, who by this time was swinging wildly and forfeiting rounds because of low blows, the garden was yelling for a game fighter. The fight went the 15 round distance and Henry Armstrong's autobiography describes the official verdict best when it reads, Now the fighters were stood in their corners waiting for ring announcer Harry Blow. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Kavanagh scores seven rounds for Armstrong, six for Ambers, two even. Judge George Lacron scores eight rounds for Armstrong, seven for Ambers, Judge Marty Monroe scores it eight rounds for Ambers, seven for Armstrong. By a majority vote, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure, indeed, the greatest pleasure of my entire career in pugilism to have this distinct honour in rendering such a unique decision. One, I venture to say, that will never be duplicated. For the first time in boxing history, we have before us tonight the only man in Fistiana to win and hold three world championships at the same time simultaneously. I give you the new lightweight champion of the world, Henry Armstrong. He called Henry to the centre of the ring and held his right hand high in symbol of the victory. A roar broke from the crowd and to Henry's amazement, it was a chorus not only of cheers for the new champion, but a chorus of boos, hoots and catcalls. Well, that was hard to take. It hurt Henry more than any blow he had stopped in the ring that night. More than his cut eye and bleeding lip. He had fought his heart out to win that fight. To give the fans what they came to see. Now he had won the decision, the triple crown, and they booed. Well, irrespective of what those thousands in attendance thought that night, many boxing experts understood the significance of Henry's victory. And what he had achieved, which led Nat Fleischer to ask in his Ring magazine, who is going to stop Henry Armstrong? There is in this scrapper Armstrong, who comes in under £135, the protein quality of George Dixon. There is in this homicidal Hank, the disdain for giving away weight, which was Joe Walcott's. There is in this new sensation the cleverness and skill 
which made the glory of Joe Gans. Who is there to quill this deadly combination? First, Armstrong whipped Peter Saron for the featherweight title. Then, Henry astonished everybody by giving Barney Ross an unmerciful wailing and taking the welter championship from him. Finally, Armstrong took Ambers into camp, thus becoming the first fighter to gain three world titles. Ring history was written brilliantly when Armstrong carried off the third world championship within a space of 10 months by gaining a 15-round decision over Ambers. So at this point, Henry Armstrong had fought in over 100 fights. Many suggest 106 at this time. He knocked out 59 of them, lost only 11 and drew 7. Of course, his record, you know, give or take, has changed through the years. But many careers have ended here, but not this all-time great. He will go on to fight another 74 more fights. Again, depending on your source. And we will go through all of his most significant bouts in part two of this episode. Great way to end the first part of the Henry Armstrong career profile. And like you've just said there, Johnson, he's quite right. Like Most people would probably think this would be a great time to just round up the rest of his career in quite a short space of time and then say that's kind of it for Henry Armstrong. But this is not what we do, guys, here at the Career Profiles podcast. We've told you a story up to a point now of Henry Armstrong's career where this is where he solidifies his legendary status. This is the only man to have ever done something like this. And and quite rightly, as Fleischer said, don't think we'll ever, ever see anything like this again in our lifetimes, in maybe our child's lifetime, our children, our grandchildren will probably never see anything like this. It is one of a kind feat that it'll be very difficult to replicate in, especially in this modern era of the sport. I think it'd be very difficult to replicate that sort of a feat. But there we go, guys. That is part one. We have covered his early beginnings. We have covered his trials and tribulations of going through the professional ranks and how difficult it was for him at times as well. I think people don't really realise that his form in the ring at times was inconsistent until he goes on that fantastic run and where he starts to pick up the titles and within that space of 10 months he wins three world titles in three different ways absolutely an unbelievable feat indeed and it's been an absolutely fantastic tale for part one but like we said that is not the end we are coming with a part two but just to reflect upon part one Johnston now we can understand truly can't we why Henry Armstrong is an absolute legend because that feat in particular is a feat that will never ever be replicated it won't ever I mean you know you could talk about super divisions like whether it be super lightweight and super welterweight no one you know from literally a featherweight lightweight welterweight it's it's insane and the way he just skips lightweight as well jumps straight on to, to Barney Ross uh, it's so impressive I mean, that's just incredible when you think about it. 126 pounds and he at featherweight. And he, he he made that weight comfortably. He always come in under the 126 pound limit to then go on all the way up to 147 pounds and not just beat an average guy at world weight division. Okay, Barney Ross was on the tail end of his career. It was his last ever professional fight when he got absolutely mauled. But to maul him the way he did, no one had ever done that to Barney Ross. Incredible, incredible. I think that's probably why he got booed from Lou Amber's um, win as well because of that what he'd done to Barney but look what a tremendous fire um an interesting start to his life and didn't really need to go into boxing he seemed like quite an educated boy for the times and you know I, I think uh he really did have a patchy start didn't he Sean I mean losing his first his first four fights he's lost three all right his fighters Melody Jackson at the time before he ends up becoming Emory Armstrong but you know how many fighters have gone through that we, there's a few tremendous fighters that lost their professional debuts, but for him to lose three of his four, and to pretty much in on Los Angeles at the time, he was pretty much fighting on the Mexican circuit, which we always say how tough that is. Uh, that's probably why he, he was dealt so many losses. And even then, some of them defeats weren't really defeats. He, I think he had won them fights. It's just a decision went against him because he was the away fighter. But that being said, he goes on that run in 1937, knocking people out for fun. Gets fire, a ring magazine fire of the year. Beats Joe Lewis to that as well, which must have been a huge achievement. And then he just goes on, on from one to the next on his shoulder. And 
all those writers and how much they really recognise him at this point as the greatest at this moment in time. And some do begin to figure out, is he the greatest of all time even then? And it still remains today. I mean, what an absolute beast he was, Sean. What it, tremendous, absolutely tremendous. Tremendous fighter indeed. But it's not over. We have got part two coming up. So please do make sure you stick around for part two. And if you've listened to this and you've picked it up a couple of weeks after it's been released, well, chances are part two is already out there as well. So get straight on to the second part of Henry Armstrong's career profile. Thank you so much, as always, guys, for listening to the show. And we want to say a big thank you to the patrons of the podcast for supporting us separately and allowing us to get all the literature needed to do a career profile on someone like Henry Armstrong. It is very difficult to source material for someone who fought so long ago and and in terms of literature it's difficult to find very consistent literature because as we've mentioned sources can vary in terms of records resumes people he's for stories even so what we try to do is give you a complete picture and when we get that support from the patrons and we get support from the Sports Social Podcast Network, it allows us to go out there and do that. So a big thank you to those that have supported us through the Patreon membership. We hope you've enjoyed this episode ad-free and early, of course. And if you're not a patron to the BTR Boxing Podcast Network, you can check us out at patreon.com forward slash BTR Boxing Podcast Network. If you do want to follow us on social media, you can do so by checking us out at Career underscore profiles on twitter and everywhere else is the btr boxing podcast network please make sure you leave a comment on spotify if you are listening through spotify there will be a question underneath the episode which asks you what did you think of the episode please let us know your thoughts on the episode and about henry armstrong's career profile in this first part like we said we will be back shortly with part two of the career profile of henry armstrong Thank you for listening to the Career Profiles podcast.